This is a video lecture about Fermat's principle. Fermat's principle is a starting point or a jumping off point for ray optics or geometrical optics. Um, this lecture is good for, say, if you needed to solve a graded index problem where the scale of the grading of the index, the spatial scale, is much larger than your wavelength. Or you just wanted to learn about graded index problems or you just wanted some slow and esoteric introduction to geometrical optics. Geometrical optics is the approximation for optics in the limit that your index of refraction or your permittivity or in general your material properties, the material that the light's propagating through, change but change at scales that are much larger than the wavelengths. And even though that's what it's supposed to be, we often apply it to lens design where that is definitely not the case. But Stale's Law still works, and so we just abuse it how we like it. Say so I have two fixed points. Then I can define a functional that is a mapping from the paths that go between those two points to a scalar. That functional being the integral the path integral, that is, from one point to the other of the index of refraction as a function of space. Then, to state for Matt's principle would be to say that the functional derivative of the path integral from the first point to the second of the index of refraction along that path is zero. To give some intuition as to what this means, index of refraction in its simplest description is simply the reduction in this propagation speed of electromagnetic radiation through a medium due to the polarization of that medium. Um, for the purposes of this lecture, we're going to disregard anisotropic materials, disregard dispersion, and just treat in as a scalar. Um, so we're also going to not distinguish between group index and the phase velocity. So propagation velocity inside the medium is just the speed of light in vacuum divided by n. So the distance it, over which the light would travel to get from point P1 to P2 is s, and the time it takes to get from P1 to, point to P2 is equal to s divided by the speed, which is the speed of light, divided by the index of refraction. So, the time it takes is proportional to the distance by the constant n divided by c naught. And c naught is a physical constant, and so n is proportional to the time it takes to get from point P1 to P point P2. So if you want to dumb down for Matt's principle for the kids, as I write, dumbed down for the kids, you say that if light were to get from point P1 to point 2, it would do so in a way that would take the least amount of time. Now I said the least time here, but originally I said originally I said just that the functional derivative would be zero, which doesn't narrow down the amount of solutions to those in which time is specifically minimized. But if we look intuitively at this problem, if we were to have a path for which time was minimized, and we're going to perturb it with some squiggly perturbation, we could easily, we could easily increase the travel time from point P1 to P point P2 with an arbitrary perturbation to the path. But it would be difficult to imagine a perturbation that would decrease the travel time. Um, that's something unpleasant to think about or pleasant to think about depending on if you're in, into this kind of thing. And so oftentimes 
the stationary pass are minimum pass. They're obviously not always minimum pass. Sometimes we have a reflection off an interface. An interface between two separate indices of reflect refraction in one and in two. And obviously, this is not the path that would take the least time to get from point P1 to point P2. This path would obviously take less time if in one, in two and in two, one were constants and both these regions were uniform in index. But that's why you often hear it often hear it, hear it said this way that light takes the least amount of time to go from point one P1 to point P2. If you can come up with a way such that there's a path from P1 to P2 that takes the most amount of time. Like you can come up with an, a distribution of in space of index of refraction um, with, such a, with such a solution for a path. That would be impressive to me. Um, I personally can't think of one. If I were to make a mound or a region of high index of refraction where to go from point P1 to point P2, it would take more time to go straight through than for it to go, to, excuse me, it would actually take, yeah, it would take more time to go straight through than for it to go around. Then you would think, okay, I would have a maximum here in this path that went straight through because it would take less time to go around this way and less time to go around this way. But if this function here were smooth, like if this hill was nice and rounded and smooth, then if you had a path that went over the top of the hill and you were to perturb it a little bit back and forth as you went over the top of the hill, well, it's locally flat at the top because there's a maximum. So you would still be able to make a path that took even more time to go through, right? So that would still be a minimum. Um, so it's very difficult for me to think of a maximum. Um, anyway. When presented with a functional minimization problem, the first thing I would want to do is write down the Euler-Lagrange equations. And trust me, eventually I will do that. But first, I'd like to do a kitty problem um, involving the simplified statement I made of Fermat's principle. So say we have a coordinate system, and we decide to take all of the material to the right of the y-axis and make it one index of refraction and all the material to the left to make it a different index of refraction. And we have two points, one on one side of the interface between the two indices and the other on the other. And say we just wanted to find, forgetting the, station, the stationarity or if that's even a word, a functional, just find the path that takes the least amount of time from point P1 to point two. P2, so I'll write that down. Now we would presume that in the regions of constant index, the path that the photons would take would be straight lines. That being, if I were to perturb these straight lines in some way, then I would get a path that would be longer than them. right? So even if I kept the place where I'd cross between in one and in two the same, if I were to perturb either of these straight lines, I'd get a path that would be longer than if it was a straight line. And so we're just going to presume that they're straight lines in the regions of constant index. We don't actually know whether or not it's a straight line globally or whether or not it will change direction at the interface. Because let's say that in two were greater than in one. So like say in two is greater than in one. The path may look like the picture I've drawn where the light wants to spend more time in in one because it can travel faster in in one. And so it can get closer to point number two by staying in in one longer and going farther up while being in in one, or vice versa. So we'd like to solve this. So I would start by just writing down how long it would take to get from the first point to the second point. 
And that would simply be the first index of a fraction times the distance from the first point to the interface. I'm going to name this point 0 comma y3. So this would be x1 squared plus y3 minus y1 squared plus the second index of a fraction multiplied by the distance it would travel in the second index of a fraction which would be x2 squared plus y2 minus y3 squared. And then just take a derivative with respect to y3. So this is just in 1 times y3 minus y1 divided by the square root of x1 squared plus y3 minus y1 squared minus into y2 minus y3 divided by square root of x2 squared plus y3 minus y2 squared. I gotta check I didn't make a sign error somewhere in there. Um, but it does, it's not that obvious right from the start. Now y3 minus y1 over the hypotenuse, that is, if I can label y3 minus y1, that's this. So that would be the sine of this angle, which I'll call theta 1. And then y2 minus y3 over the hypotenuse is this distance here. And so y2 minus y3 over the hypotenuse is the sine of this angle here. So I'll rewrite this expression as such. In 1 sine of theta 1 minus in 2 sine of theta 2 equals 0. Or in 1 sine of theta 1 is equal to in 2 sine of theta 2. And this has a name. It's very well known. It's boring. It's called Snell's Law. I'm not super satisfied with this as a proof of Snell's Law, but it demonstrates its plausibility, and many people would be satisfied. Like, they would look at this and believe Snell's Law. In fact, I don't think anybody would look at anything and not believe Snell's Law because it's been demonstrated to them in labs many times over. Okay, now for another example problem. Say that we have another interface in 1 and in 2. And for this problem specifically, I want in 1 to be less than in 2. And so I have two points, just like before. But this time, they're both on the same side of the interface. And let's think of the paths by which I can travel from point P1 to point P2. So 1 is a straight line. I would presume the straight line is a local minimum. If I were to perturb the straight line by some perturbation, I would increase the path length. Another we may think of, but I haven't done any work showing that it's possible yet, or it agrees with Fermat's principle, is reflecting off the interface, so I could reflect off the interface. But one might think, well, the light can travel faster in material in 1 as opposed to in 2. Right, so if in one were sufficiently small and the points were close enough to the interface, you would think it might be possible that a path like this could take less time than a path just straight to material in two. And because perturbations from a straight line just make things longer, you would think, okay, so this right here is definitely longer than, say, just this grazing or just moving along the this, just just a little bit to the left of the interface and I want a straight line to get there and a straight line to get to the second point. So I want to go a straight line to the interface, just travel barely to the left of the interface and then take another straight line from the interface back to point P2. Uh, would that be a possible path of minimum time? And if it were, what would be the angles? 
Okay, I don't necessarily like the way I phrased that. In order for a path to be stationary, it could just be a local minimum, right? It doesn't have to be a global minimum. So as long as the path is shorter in length than any perturbation to it, then it's fine. Um, that can be achieved by most efficiently optimizing the material in one, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a faster path than a straight line. It just needs to be faster than anything close to but not it. So again, just like before, we'll write down the time. So let's name these points things. I'll call this one 0 comma y3 and call this one 0 comma y4. So my time I take is into times x1 squared plus y3 minus y2 squared plus in 1 times y4 minus y3 plus in 2 again times x2 squared plus y2 minus y4 squared. And I take the partials with respect to y3 and y4. So first I take the partial with respect to y3. And that's just into y3 minus y2 over the square root of x1 squared plus y3 minus y2 squared minus in 1 y3. And there's no y4 in that expression at all. Um, there's no y3 over here also. I tend to write that a lot. Um, I so there's no y4 left in this expression. So this expression solely gives me the location of y3 if I set this equal to 0. And I see a sine of an angle again. Here's another sine of an angle. So what angle is that? Well, it's an angle that's really hard to draw here because of my drawing so bad. I'll call it theta 1. So this is in, into sine of theta 1 minus in 1 equals 0. Or into sine of theta 1 is equal to in 1. We have a name for this angle because apparently Supposedly, we would know what in 1 and in 2 would be. So we, we would know what the sine inverse of in 1 over in 2 is. And that's called the critical angle. The critical angle for total internal reflection. So say we were to perform Snell's law, where theta 2, well, my things are mixed up, but say theta 1 sine of theta, in 1 sine of theta 1 is equal to in 2 sine of theta 2, if theta 2 were equal to pi over 2, then we'd get in 1 sine of theta 1 is equal to in 2. And as long as in 2 were less than in 1, we could find a real angle there. And that angle we would call a critical angle. Likewise, we could also take the partial with respect to y4 and we would get a similar expression. I would call this theta 2. That would be, and then I'll box this. That would be into sine of theta 2 also equal to 1. So you just get the same local physical law a second time. So this wave um, is called surface wave. The often neglected um, local minimum time path you could take um, if there's a no nearby material of low index of refraction. Now, of course, light doesn't know that it wants to get to point two. It's just going to propagate from point one and come from come what may. So it's just going to go to this interface. And then energy can travel along the interface if incident on the interface at the critical angle. Um, and this is how this shows up in ray optics.
Now, what of the Euler-Lagrange equations? Well, let me write the statement again. An integral from the first point to the second point, the path integral that is, of the index of refraction. So first I gotta make the parametrization of my curve arbitrary because the Euler-Lagrange equations are the solutions to the fixed endpoint problem. If I have an arc length parametrization, then perturbing the path one value of the parameter by another is going to change which what the value of the parameter is going to be at the end, right? Perturbing the path changes its arc length. So we gotta make the parametrization arbitrary. So let me call my arbitrary parameter tau and say x dot is equal to dx d tau y dot is equal to dy d tau and so on. Then my path integral will look like the, integ the integral from tau 1 to tau 2 of the index of refraction as a function of x of tau y of tau and z of tau times the velocity, magnitude of the velocity with respect to tau, and these are all squared, d tau. And the way I've written this here, sorry, missing parentheses, um, is in Cartesian coordinates. I could write something like integral from tau 1 to tau 2 of in uh, r of tau phi of tau z of tau square root of z dot squared plus r dot squared plus r phi dot squared for example. Whatever coordinate system boasts, best suits the geometry of your problem. Then I can apply the Euler-Lagrange equations. So I will do that. Um, first I take the partial with respect to the variables x, y, or z. I'm only going to do this for Cartesian coordinates for this particular lecture. So del n del x is equal to d d tau. We have to put in, oh goodness, x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared is equal to d d tau of n multiplied by x dot over square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared. And that's the equation for x, and there's a similar one for both y and z. If you're totally lost, well, you will continue to be totally lost. Um, but if you're only kind of lost, if I condense everything inside of my integral and call it f, which is a function of r and r dot, what I'm doing here is del f del x is equal to d d tau of del f del x dot. Okay. Now once I've written down my differential equation, it should, and this is very confusing, work for any particular parametrization. So for example, I can make tau equal to one of the coordinates like z. And this is very useful sometimes. In that case, um, del n del x times the square root of del x del z squared plus del y del z squared plus 1 would equal to d dz of n times del x del z divided by the square root of the same stuff all over again So that's a useful parametrization sometimes. Another one that's useful is making tau 
the physical time. So what happens if I make tau the physical time? Well, this here becomes the physical velocity, right? Or the change in path length with respect to time. So this reduces to del in del x times ds dt equals d dt of in times dx dt over ds dt. Now I'm going to be sacrilegious and manipulate differentials like fractions like a physicist and then just call this dx ds and I'm also going to divide both sides by ds dt so then this will be del in del x is equal to dt ds d dt of n dx ds and then I'm going to cancel these dt's and get del n del x is equal to d ds of n dx ds. And there's a similar equation for y and a similar equation for z and so you could write all three of them together as the gradient of n is equal to d ds times n the r vector ds. And this is the formula you see in Sole and Tyke. And this is where it comes from, provided you could accept this abuse of the chain rule along the way. Sorry, there's supposed to be a squared here. So now that we have these examples of the Euler-Lagrange equations, let's try to apply them to various distributions of index of refraction. So the simplest distribution I can think of, well, besides just a constant, is two half planes. So one index of refraction on one side of the y-axis and the other index of refraction on the other, such that, say our coordinate system has an x and a y, index of refraction is only a function of x. So n, which I can put x and then I can put y inside just because, is equal to n1, plus n2 minus n1 times unit step of x. Then I can write down the Euler-Lagrange equation for y. So del n del y is equal to d ds of n dy ds. That is 0 is equal to d ds of n dy ds. And on the left side, that would be d ds of n1 dy ds. And on the left side, it would be n2, of course. And this is equal to 0. Which means that along the arc length, n1 dy ds dy ds. I'll make that more clear. some constant is equal to n1 times dy ds. Because n1 is a constant in that region, dy ds is equal to a constant. But what is dy ds? Well, it's the change in y with respect to path length. So it's the ratio of this to this. And if that has to be a constant, that means that the, the path can never turn. So this implies that in regions of constant index of refraction, light travels or energy travels in a straight line.
And that may have been obvious, but at least we have some sort of proof-like statement of that. I don't know if I would be confident enough to call this a proof, but it looks a whole lot like one. Okay. So now, we, but we also have this interface. We have one region occupied by N1 and another region occupied by N2, right? So, and DDS of this has to be zero. So this statement, if I plug in just in, instead of in one, because I want to include the whole space, must be true. So dy ds is equal to some constant divided by n. Or should I say in one dy ds in the left region is equal to in two dy ds in the right region. Now again, what is dy ds? Well, it is the sign of this angle. All right, this here. This is delta S, this is delta Y. Opposite over hypotenuse is sine. So, this is Snell's law. And this gives me a more satisfying justification of Snell's law than before, because we have solved, quote unquote, Fermat's principle using the Euler-Lagrange equations and come up with Snell's law. Now, you may say, there's isn't there also an X equation, right? Don't we have delta X is equal to DDS of in dx ds. And yeah, you have this, it's a pain to deal with, I won't deal with it, so I'm too lazy. One more thing to notice though, is that dy ds times n1 is a constant, right? But dy ds is the same for a path like this and a path like that, right, where the, the change in x with respect to s has a flipped sign, but the change in y with respect to s is the same, right? So theoretically, you could, as far as the y equation is, is concerned, you could have a solution where suddenly the direction it's traveling in x flips, right? And dx ds changes sign, but dy ds still remains a constant as we showed has to happen. Um, and this can happen, and it's reflection. So if you were managed to decipher the quagmire that is the x equation, you would have to have two different things that the this delta function would cause. One is reflection, the other is refraction. Um, so have at it. Myself as an editor has two things to say here. One is that I just forgot the n2 minus n1 here on the left side. And two, I've decided to record some additional material to clean up the mess I've left regarding how Fermat's principle treats reflection. Um, so you don't have to wait that long. In summary, the light would always refract. Right, so the Euler-Lagrange equations for Fermat's principle says that light always refracts, except when the incident angle is past the critical angle for total internal reflection, then it always reflects. And this degrees, disagrees with more accurate theories we have of reflection and refraction, such as the Fresnel equations from electromagnetic optics. Um, so when we do ray optics, we typically will just import um, knowledge about about how much will reflect or refract or import that we know that reflection still occurs even if we're less than the critical angle.
My next example distribution of n, I call the Poincaré upper half plane problem. So Poincaré upper half plane problem. I accidentally color, color picked white. So for this problem, speed will increase linearly with the distance away from the x-axis. So say I make it a two-dimensional problem. I can do this if I have an index of refraction that does not depend on, say, z, then z as a constant is a solution. So I can discard axes that are not relevant. Um, speed is equal to K, I'll call it capital KY. Or index of refraction is equal to 1 over, I'll call it lowercase k, y. Now obviously, solutions to this don't make any sense physically below some line where the speed is equal to the speed of light in vacuum. So it would make sense only up here somewhere. Obviously, that was a misspeak. The solutions make physical sense when the speed of light is greater than but not including zero. And less than C naught, so actually this is the physically valid region. So I would like to solve this both ways, one using the coordinate x as our parameter and the other one using time as a parameter. However, this one is easiest using x as a parameter. So I'll start by writing the x equation, that is del in del x times the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared is equal to d dx of 1 over ky times 1 over the square root of 1 plus del y del x squared. Now, the index of refraction does not depend on x, so goodbye. So 0 is equal to d dx of 1 over ky times 1 over square root of 1 plus del y del x squared. So just consider this as just y is a function of x, right? So in that case, we have a constant here, constant with respect to x is equal to 1 over ky as 1 over square root of 1 plus dy dx squared. And then we just algebraically solve for dy dx. So 1 over c1 ky is equal to the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared. And k can be absorbed into the constant, so we notice that what k is doesn't matter, actually. So it does not change the path of our stationary solutions. So I'll just absorb that into the constant. Um, so 1 over constant absorption minus 1 is equal to dy dx squared. So dy dx is equal to the square root, or 1 over the constant, y squared minus 1. And this is separable, which is nice. So dy times 1 over the square root of 1 over c1, which is just another constant, uh, minus y squared. I put y on top. This squared needs to look more like a squared. Is equal to dx. And then I can just use substitution here. Um, there's a minus sign, which I have to deal with. So It'd be something like hmm, 
the square root of 1 over c1 minus y squared with a minus sign is equal to x. And I'm going to square both sides anyway, so whatever with the minus sign. x squared is equal to 1 over something. There's got to have another constant here. I'll call it c2. Um, so that would make me have to modify the left side here. So x plus c2 squared is equal to 1 over c1 minus y squared. And this right here is very simple to interpret. These are circles where the center, well, the radius is 1 over the square root of 1 over c, is the square root of 1 over c1, right? So I can interpret 1 over c1 as radius squared. And c2 is just the x coordinate of the center. And the y coordinate of the center is 0. So my, my, the paths that the light takes are circles of any radius and centered anywhere on the x-axis. It may bother you that the paths are not unique if they originate on the x-axis. But remember that the speed of light on the x-axis is zero, so the x-axis makes no physical sense anyway. You can't originate light at the x-axis. And any initial direction off the x-axis does determine a unique trajectory for the light to take. So that's how you solve this using x as the parameter. When editing this, I found I did some bad math here. Um, this right here is just the bottom half of a circle. And so if I square both sides, I get an entire circle. So it's not the same. I can't just arbitrarily square both sides. I create extra solutions. How you resolve this is, so I go all the way up to this step. This right here is signed. You can have either sign. And so when I square both sides to go from here to here, I'm not creating new solutions that previously weren't there because in this step I could account for them with either sign of my constant. And then when I go from this step to this step, I'm forgetting a plus or minus here. And that plus or minus carries through over here and carries through over here. And so actually I don't have just the bottom of a circle here. I have both the top and the bottom of a circle. So when I square both sides, I don't create extra solutions that previously weren't there. Oops, sorry. Now I'm going to solve the Poincaré upper half plane tr problem a second time. But this time instead of using x as my parameter, I'm going to use the gradient of n is equal to ddS of n dr dS. So I'll start with the y equation. So that is del n del y is equal to ddS of n dy ds which is equal to del n del y times dy ds and then there's also in here a del n del x dx ds and a del n del z dz ds but n doesn't depend on x or z, and so these are zero. Multiply by dy ds plus n times the second derivative of y with respect to s. And then plugging in my expression for n as a function of y, minus 1 over ky squared plus, whoops, not plus, it's an equals, equals 
del n del y, which is minus 1 over ky squared, times dy ds squared, plus 1 over ky times d2y over ds squared. And then, just like in the case in which we used x as our parameter, what k is doesn't matter, turns out. So we can get rid of all the k's. We can multiply both sides by y squared. So, minus 1 is equal to minus dy ds squared plus y squared y over ds squared or y times d2y over ds squared is equal to first derivative with respect to s squared minus 1. Now I don't know how hard this differential equation is to solve if you don't know the answer beforehand. Because we solved this problem a different way and we know our solutions are going to be circles, um, we have a pretty good idea, have a pretty good guess as to what our parameter parametrization would be. Um, because the arc length parametrization of a circle um, is going to include sine of s or cosine of s. But looking at this equation I have here, it seems somewhat intuitively obvious that sines and cosines would work as solutions. Um, although I know no systematic way to find that out because the equation is nonlinear. So say y were equal to cosine of s. Then I would have cosine of s times minus cosine of s is equal to sine squared of s minus 1. And this is minus 1 minus sine squared of s, which is equal to minus cosine squared of s. So this works. And similarly, sine of s also works. And so similarly, cosine of s plus an arbitrary phase works. Now, you may notice that you can't just add an arbitrary, arbitrary constant to y because we have a y by itself here and the constant, there's no way to get rid of the constant. Um, but if we think about it, there is a way for us to change the magnitude or the radius of the circle. Uh, we just have to make sure that we have something inside the cosine so that when we take two derivatives or one derivative and square it, um, we cancel out the, ex the excess radius. So it turns out y is equal to radius times cosine of s divided by radius plus an arbitrary phase works. Okay, so now that we have our solution for y, let's go to the x equation. So that is del n, sorry, I used red, del n del x is equal to ddS of n dx ds. Now del n del x is equal to zero. So then this is just zero is equal to del n del y dy ds times dx ds plus n second derivative with respect to s. Or I can write this as 0 is equal to minus 1 over ky squared y ds dx ds plus 1 over ky squared x over ds squared. And as usual, what k is doesn't matter. Um, and I'm left with 0 is equal to second derivative squared minus y times
and I use the product of the first derivatives. Now we already know what y is, right? y is equal to some radius it's in arc length parameterization and a trig function. And so I don't know why I wrote this the way I did. It's incorrect. It's y over here. And we have two products of two, so you would expect y x probably is also a trig function and you have two products of trig functions subtracted is zero. So expect both of these to be the same thing. They have to be equal to each other. So say y were cosine of x, you would expect maybe x is sine of x to work and that does like that, that indeed does work. So if y is cosine of x, this is zero is equal to cosine of s times minus cosine of s actually minus sine of s. I don't know what I'm writing. <sighs> minus sine of s with a minus sign times cosine of s. And these do cancel and you get zero. And then like y, you can put a arbitrary radius on x. It has to be the same as the radius you added for added for y. And to account for this 90 degree phase, I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna cross this out and say x is equal to a cosine of s over a plus the same phase applied to y. Um, and then sine is cosine shifted to the right, so that would be minus pi over 2. Now with our y equation, and also similar with x equation, we have y by itself out here. But with x we don't have any x by itself. We're taking at least one derivative with respect to s every place that x appears. And so we can add an arbitrary constant to x, which I'll call c. So my circle can shift on the x-axis, but not along y. And so in the end, we have a parameterization of a circle with radius a and centered on the x-axis at c, which is the exact same thing we had if we were to parameterize using x. My next example problem is a cell fox lab. A cell fox lab is something with an index profile something like this. Um, as you can see, if y were to reach 1 over alpha, then the index would go to 0. So there be some there should be some sort of limit on y here so over in naught is less than square root of 1 minus alpha squared y squared so alpha squared y squared is equal to or should i say less than 1 minus 1 over in naught squared so y is less than 1 over alpha square root of 1 minus 1 over n naught squared. Um, if you care about that, which I don't pay much mind. Um, if you want to approximate it as a parabola, that would of course be um, n naught times 1 minus 1 half alpha squared y squared. So to solve for the trajectories, um, first I'm going to assume this is a 2D problem. So I'm going to choose solutions for which x is equal to a constant. And the light moves along z. So we're going to presume before we even solve the problem 
that our answers are going to move along z and they're going to kind of oscillate in y. Um, it's easiest to solve this problem where we assume our parameter is z or make our parameter z. Um, then we have two equations, the y equation and the z equation. So z equation is del n del z equals square root of 1 plus del y del z squared is equal to d d z of n, which is n naught square root of 1 minus alpha squared y squared times 1 over square root of 1 plus dy dz squared. So this right here is the z equation. And we have a similar y equation, del n del y. Um, we always have this factor, which makes me have to write a lot. It's equal to d d z of n naught And then we have dy dz on top. And this is the y equation, and I'm going to work with the z, equa z equation and likely never with the y equation. Sorry, this is supposed to be a dz, and it's supposed to be a closing parenthesis here. So because n does not depend on z, 0 is equal to ddz of n as 1 over the square root of 1 plus y dz squared, which means that this factor inside is constant as I move along z. So as I move along z, that doesn't change. So I'm going to call this constant um, probably c1 times n naught, I guess. Um, just to make up an arbitrary name. That's equal to n naught square root of 1 minus alpha squared y squared divided by square root of 1 plus dy dz squared, um, which implies, now I'm going to square both sides, which comes up with extra solutions. However, my arbitrary constant can have either sign, and so it accounts for both types of solutions that you would get if you squared both sides, reduced to this in some way. Um, so 1 minus alpha squared y squared divided by 1 plus this side will be squared, dy, dz squared. And then we can solve algebraically for dy, dz. So dy, dz is equal to the square root of, I have to check my notes, 1 over c1 squared minus 1 minus 1 over c1 squared alpha squared y squared. Hopefully there isn't a mistake in there somewhere. No, there doesn't appear to be a mistake in there. Okay. Um, and this is separable, luckily. So dy times 1 over the square root of 1 over c1 squared minus 1 minus 1 over c1 squared alpha squared y squared is equal to dz. Now you may recall that d dx of sine inverse of x is equal to 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. So you would expect this to be some sort of variation on sine inverse and in fact it is. So you end up in the end with y is equal to square root of 1 minus c1 squared divided by alpha times the sine of alpha over c1 z plus c2, or c2 is just the integration constant from this side. So cool. And we don't even have to deal with 
the y equation. This just all came from the z equation. So we can see that our rays travel in sinusoid, uh, along sinusoids um, with if c1 is close to 1, the it's not really a wave number because this is not the propagation of a wave. It's the motion of like a Newtonian corpuscle, right, or a photon, in a sinu along a sinusoidal trajectory. Um, as c1 gets close to 1, that trajectory has a spatial frequency of alpha, and the amplitude is very small. If you're curious what happens, what happens if at this stage, so at this stage, I decide to do a small angle approximation. Assume that y, alpha y is much smaller than 1, and dy dz is also much smaller than 1. Um, that would uh, produce a very similar result, and you solve it extremely similarly, and it looks like y is equal to the square root of 1 minus c1 times 2 divided by alpha times the sine of alpha over square root of c1 z plus c2. And inside the square root we have a pretty good approximation of 1 minus c1 squared. We have a linear approximation of that. But we have an approximation of c1 as the square root of c1 which is not a good approximation of C1 at all because the rate of change is a lot different. Um, so at small angles, we would just like to kind of, if we wanted to approximate this for small angles, we just kind of, we have to assume that C1 is so close to 1 that the square root of C1 is a good approximation of C1, which means that that should go away, essentially. And, uh, if I can get my brush to turn back to black, um, y is equal to some small amplitude sine of alpha z plus c2. And you may think this would make sense because our solutions don't make a lot of physical sense when our launch angle is very high. So if I have my solution so what happens if I vary the parameter c1 well as c1 goes to 0 the spatial, spatial frequency of the trajectory um, goes to infinity essentially so that means that my launch angle into the slab goes to infinity or I get arbitrarily close to vertical. My amplitude asymptotically approaches 1 over alpha, which means that my maximum extent for y is when the index of refraction is equal to 0, which makes no, makes no physical sense. It makes mathematical sense, but not physical sense. So at a certain launch angle, I start getting solutions that don't make physical sense. And of course, for small launch angles, my spatial frequency approaches too high over alpha. And so, my intersections approach pi over alpha apart. And that can be the case It's seemingly the case for all kinds of different small angles. And so you may hear it said that the Selfock fiber, this is Selfock slab, I make it 3D and make a fiber. Um, for the Selfock fiber, it channels horizontal rays, multiple in the paraxial approximation, horizontal rays to a single point, which is the behavior of a lens. And so therefore the Selfock fiber behaves like a lens. Okay, so I'm going to add two appendices to this um, analytical Selfock problem. Um, the first one would be the Selfock fiber, right? So Selfock fiber 
is just n is equal to n naught square root of 1 minus r squared alpha squared. And so I can set up my functional as either um, integral over time. I put my distribution of n inside here, and then my velocity. Or I can just write it like this. And I won't bother solving that in this lecture. I'll just kind of leave it to you to do that. It might be the easiest to do it numerically. I saw in post a lot of writing mistakes here. Um, this, uh, this is supposed to be an R. Um, I drew an R, but it may not be perfectly clear. This is supposed to be an alpha. In my velocity here, there should be a z dot squared. This here should be an alpha, not an r or an n. Um, the trajectories to the Selfock fiber will look the same as a Selfock slab if the initial velocity of your carrier of energy is on axis. So if this is r, I'm launching on axis, but if I launch in some skew direction, it's going to be different. Okay, my, my second appendix. would be how to evaluate integrals of the form 1 over the square root of a minus b z squared dz or I changed my mind I'm going to make it y so y squared dy um, I make the trig substitution square root of b over a y is equal to sine theta and so the square root of b over a dy is equal to cosine of theta d theta so this integral would then equal 1 over the square root of a and then inside I have 1 over the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta square root of a over b cosine of theta d theta and one square root of one minus sine squared theta is just cosine of theta so this is equal to one over the square root of b integral d theta which is equal to one over the square root of b times theta plus a constant and theta is equal to the sine inverse of the square root of b over a y and so to keep everything on the same page I'm going to write this really small this is going to equal to 1 over the square root of b sine inverse of square root of b over a y plus a constant. Okay then, and just like with the Poincaré upper half plane, once I've solved the Selfox slab by making the parameter one of my coordinates, I'm also going to solve the Selfox slab by making my parameter time. And again, the time cancels and the only thing left is arc length. So as a reminder, that is this again, and this again. or so just as always just as I've done before I'm going to apply the product rule um, and I'm going to do it to the y equation so that's dn ds times dy ds 
plus n, two derivatives of y with respect to s, is equal to the partial of n with respect to y. And as it, when it comes to dn ds, that is del n del x times dx ds plus del n del y times dy ds plus del n del z times dz ds um, times dy ds, right, same term, and so on. But index of refraction does not depend on x or z. So I'm left with del n del y dy ds squared plus my n times the second derivative of y with respect to s is equal to my partial of n with respect to y. Now, I haven't said anything up until now, but I'm going to solve this numerically because I like to have a numerical example somewhere in the lecture. Um, you may not have to solve this numerically. After all, when we solved it the other way, we solved it analytically. But sometimes it's better to solve problems that you can solve analytically numerically because then, well, you know that your answer is correct when you get to the end. So to do that, I'm going to define new variables. Why? Because I want first order differential equations. Why? Because how I like to numerically solve these things is with something called a runga kutta 4 5 scheme. And to perform a runga kutta 4 5 scheme, I need systems of first order differential equations. Second order differential equations won't do. So I'm going to say big Y is equal to dy ds. Um, and d squared y ds squared, well, it's the derivative of y with respect to s. And I'm going to name this, because I'm lazy, y dot. I know s isn't time, and usually you preserve dot notation for when your independent variable is time. But it's easier to write that than write y prime, so I'm just going to write y dot. So this can then be written as minus alpha squared y. Um, I'm just writing out del n del y. times big Y squared plus my N times big Y dot is equal to Y divided by square root of 1 minus alpha squared Y squared. And as you would expect, what N naught is doesn't matter. Remember when we solved this analytically, what n naught is did not affect the shape of the tra trajectory. However, it does affect like the ex spatial extent for which the trajectory is physically valid. So I do some algebraic manipulation to isolate big Y dot and end up with big Y dot is equal to Y squared minus 1 times alpha squared Y over 1 minus alpha squared y squared. And I also have little y dot is equal to big Y. So these are two of the first order differential equations that I need. All right now that I have a y, y equations, which are meaningless so far because I actually have two equations well, I'm going to solve for I'm going to I'm going to derive the x equations. Um, these are not actually meaningless. Now we can figure out what y is with respect to arc length. But I'm going to go ahead and go for the x equations because I'm going to solve these all at once. So for the x equations, I have 
applying the product rule DDS in DX DS plus in two derivatives of X with respect to S is equal to del in del X which is zero. Similarly if I were to write a Z equation well it would look exactly the same which means it doesn't matter whether I choose X or Z here I choose which one is constant. Um, in my handwritten notes I chose X when I did my analytical solution I chose Z I guess to be consistent with my analytical solution I'll try to change the variable to Z I flip back and forth but by convention if you have propagation of light through a waveguide along the waveguide is Z right so in your expression your proper expression for your wave I guess your propagator is going to have beta Z minus omega T in it uh, sorry I forgot the minus J right here um, so if I'm working with something like a cell fox slat as a waveguide, I suppose that I should use Z. Um, and then this would just be del in, del y, dy ds, dx ds, or dz ds, my bad, forgetting that I changed to Z, plus in, the function of y, true derivatives of z with respect to s. And the x equation looks exactly the same as the z equation, so if you wanted to extend the solution to three dimensions, it's extremely easy to do so. Okay, so continuing to process this, um, I'm going to say that dx ds is equal to big X two derivatives is going to call, I'm going to call that big X dot which my big X's aren't very well distinguished from my little X's they're just bigger and so then little X dot is equal to big X um, n naught minus alpha squared in uh, y divided by square root of one minus alpha squared y squared again this is del n del y times dy ds times dz ds man I used x all over the place it's going to be really confusing big z is dz ds um, okay times n big z dot equals zero so big z dot is equal to alpha squared y over one minus alpha squared y squared big y big z and similarly big x dot is equal to alpha squared y over one minus alpha squared y squared times big x times big z um, so and then if I include that little z dot is equal to big Z and little x dot is equal to big X and make sure that these are this is obviously big then I have all six I equations I, ha I need to numerically solve this in three dimensions but when I'm going to show my example code in a second and in the sample code I only use the Z equations and the Y equations because there are solutions to this in which Z is a constant right so big X equals zero is a solution to this differential equation okay now I'm going to be explaining code <laughs> so the integrate the integrator that I'm using in Python this is Python okay is RK45 and that's under the integrate class from SciPy. So I first thing I do, I import SciPy, and then from SciPy I import integrate. And then under integrate I have RK45. 
Now I pass into RK45 several arguments. The first one is cellfoc. And cellfoc is a function. Um, cellfoc takes both the parameter and the variables with respect to that parameter. Um, in this case, I'm not going to be using, you don't actually have to put the t here because I'm not going to be using it. I don't have an in that explicitly depends on time or explicitly depends on arc length or something like that. Uh, so it turns out that even though I have, I use t throughout all my code to notate my parameter, my parameter is s actually. Um, so what cellfoc does is it maps each of the four variables to the derivatives of those variables. So in my case, my variables are little y and little z, big Y and big Z. Um, and the first, my, the L of my array goes little z, little y, big z, big y. So I'm passing in little z, little y, big z, big y into cellfoc. What, are my, what am I returning? Well, first, the fir I'm returning also another four-element array, and the first, the first element of that array is y indexed at two, which is big Z, indicating that little z dot is big Z. So what I return is the derivatives. I take the f the, the third element in the array I'm passing in and return it as the first element as of the array I'm returning because the derivative of the first of the first element is the third element. If I call the first element 0 and third element 2, you know, it's zero based indexing in python. And then I return my this my second element of the array I return is the third element of the array I'm giving because or the fourth element of the array I'm I'm passing in, sorry. I'm used to MATLAB that says there's zero based indexing in Python, so three is the fourth element, is saying that little y dot is equal to big Y. And then my my third, my the third element of the array I'm returning is my expression for I believe that's that's the expression for big Z dot, which makes sense, right? I'm passing in so the third a third element I'm passing in is big Z. So the third the third element I'm I'm returning should be big Z dot, and so I should have the expression for big Z dot um, in terms of all the other variables. And then the fourth thing I'm returning is the expression for big Y dot. Okay, the second the second argument I pass into solution is I start at time zero. It's not very important. And then my initial conditions. So my initial conditions are are this array which I defined here. Um, that is, and I'm going to solve these for families of solutions where the initial points are zero, so I'm starting at the origin. And then I'm defining my initial velocities based on an angle, right? So I'm going to sweep multiple angles using this for loop, and then my velocities are the sines and the cosine and the cosine of that angle. Um, how many time steps I'm going to do, and then what I can restrict it to to some small time step. So I'm going to run this and see what happens. Oh, okay. So what I what I'm originally doing is sweeping from one degree zero degrees to eighty degrees in launch angle. So and my alpha is one. So you can see that if I go to 80 degrees in launch angle, my amplitude is about 1 because it goes again to 1 over alpha. Um, and again, that doesn't physically make any sense because when y equals 1 over alpha, my index is equal to 0. Um, but that's what the mathematical solution looks like. Um, and as I drive my launch angle in farther and farther, my the period of this increases by a factor of c1, right? Um, now I'm going to now make this small angles. So I make it small angles, and now we can see the lens-like behavior. So it focuses parallel rays down into the into the same point approximately 
if I'm only looking from 0 to 10 degrees. And if I go from 0 to 20 degrees, I see that behavior break down. Um, and you see, start seeing some aberrations. Okay, so what about of all these numbers? So these numbers I'm printing out above the plot, those are, those look like the index of refraction. It's kind of like the group index. If you consider this a waveguide where the spatial extent of it, 1 over alpha, is a lot longer than the wavelength of light, right? So I can use ray optics to calculate the group index, which is something you don't really often get to be able to do. Um, so the group index is like 1 over the speed, assuming the speed of light is 1. Um, so 1 over the speed would be um, time, so time taken, divided by the distance along z that it's traveled on average. And that's going to be more accurate the more cycles you get. Obviously, like during a cycle, the rate of change along z changes throughout the cycle. So if I run it for longer times, I get more accurate um, values for my group index. Um, so I have to calculate the time by doing in, I have to actually do this iteration where I have in times the um, distance element because I'm not actually stepping time, I'm stepping arc length. Um, and then I just take the, the, the cumulative time and divide it by how far I've gone in z. So you'll notice that the smaller angles go faster and the larger angles go slightly slower and I can run this for a much longer time frame. which takes much longer. This is educational, it gives you an idea how long this, something like this would take if you were to try it. Um, and I see the variation in the group, group index with launch angle. And this is somewhat of a small variation in group index because I'm, I'm sweeping from you know, 0 to 0 to 20 degrees, right? And if I look at the cosine of twenty degrees, and I multiply it by one point four. I get one point three. So if I had a slab waveguide. Right, and the slab was so thick, I could use ray optics to describe the slab wave guide. If I had a launch angle that was 20 degrees, my group index would be, well, I actually messed this up. <laughs> um, I would be up at like 1.5-ish. Whereas I see here, it's actually up at 1.402. Um, so I have much less dependence on my group velocity with respect to launch angle at small angles. And so the Selfox lab, as opposed to just a step index lab at small angles, um, has much less group dispersion or different like modal dispersion, at least in the ray optics domain. Um, and that could be, you could, might think of that as something special, right? That's like the reason for using um, graded index fiber, in essence. And that's it. Okay, I'd like to clean up some of the mess I've made regarding reflections now. Um, so I guess I'll approach this using Snell's Law at first. Um, we know from the Euler-Lagrange equations that if the index of refraction does not depend on a certain coordinate and we're in Cartesian coordinates, let's say that coordinate is y, then the index of refraction multiplied by the change in y with respect to arc length remains a constant. 
and this right here is some sort of angle. It's the um, well, it's the sine of some sort of angle. That is, it's the change in y divided by the change in arc length. So that's kind of like the if we were to say project the direct the uh, vector that describes the direction the light is moving onto the xz plane it would be the sine of the angle between the xz plane and the ray um, it's difficult to draw 3d figures so I'll just be lazy and draw something in 2d so say that the index of refraction doesn't depend on y it only depends on z and we can assume that there are solutions for which x is constant, so there's no, going to be no change in x. Then, and say n changes, you know, significantly with z. Then, as my path travels kind of along z, the angle with the z-axis is going to vary, such that the index of refraction times the sine of that angle remains a constant. So I can not only apply Snell's law if I have an interface, I can apply Snell's law between any two points if I know what my what what my angle is and what my index of refraction is at one point, I know the index of refraction at the another point, I gotta know what my slope is at the other point also. So if I were to like put this in some sort of numerical simulation and integrate my Euler Lagrange equations along the path, well you're basically calculating geodesics of some ab some manifold whose metric is n squared times the identity matrix and geodesics don't split so you're just going to get one singular determined path through space and it's never going to turn around let's say a total internal reflection we'll get to that later it's not going to turn around despite you know scalar ray, ray optics and what it, and how it predicts that the energy can actually turn around what this means is for Matt's principle doesn't account for reflection at all. Um, as long if there isn't total internal reflection. And it's as soon as the light just keeps going. Um, yeah. So what happens if the index of refraction gets so low that our initial launch angle is past the critical angle for total internal reflection? Well, we did an example of that earlier. It was indeed the cell fox lab. So I'm going to try to demonstrate that. Um, so we launched into the cell fox lab at some angle, I'm going to call it phi, where our slope is the tangent of phi and the initial slope would be equal to the spatial like spatial frequency of the trajectory multiplied by the amplitude right um, but we're not gonna do that yet we're gonna call the slope kappa then my critical angle for total internal my index I'm gonna call this a critical index so this is the how low the index has to go for my launch angle to be the critical angle for total internal reflection. That is N1, which is the index of refraction on the z-axis, which is N0, multiplied by the sine of this angle, which I'll call theta, which is equal to pi over 2 minus tangent inverse of kappa. And this is, now I'll call this the critical N, is n1 times 1 over square root of 1 plus kappa squared. Now I want to show that my solution for the cell fox lab is consistent with this. So uh, my the initial slope as described by my solution to the cell fox lab is the amplitude square root of 1 minus c1 squared over alpha multiplied by the spatial frequency which is just alpha over C1. So kappa is going to equal to the square root of 1 minus C1 squared over C1. 
So if I plug that in, my critical index is in is in naught times one over square root of one plus one minus c one squared over c one squared, um, which is equal to in naught um, times one over the square root. Made a common denominator here, so that's going to cancel. So one over c one squared which is equal to n naught times c1. I guess you could have a plus or minus here. Um, but critical, critical index is something that's positive. Um, and so that's cool. Um, now I'm going to figure out what amplitude that is. So my index profile is n naught square root of 1 minus alpha squared y squared and that index when does the, what amplitude does that index equal the critical index which is n naught c1 well I just cancel my n naughts and algebraically solve for y and I get y is equal to square root of 1 minus c1 squared over alpha so my cell fox slab solutions are like so, where the light travels upward and upward in y until it reaches a y where my index of refraction is so low that it, given my initial launch angle there would be total internal reflection. And at that point the, the ray turns around and comes back and then gets to another y where I have my index so low I'm going to get total internal reflection and it's going to turn around and come back. So empirically we see that if we encounter an index that produces total internal reflection given our initial launch angle, we're going to th only then and only then will the ray turn around and come back. Um, so if we were to have the following distribution where we have in one over here and in two over here and between the two we have this region where we have a smooth transition between n1 and n2 and we could say that n2 is less than n1 then if my initial angle is small enough that I don't have total internal reflection then it's going to gradually bend and then its angle in the second medium is going to be as Snell's law would predict, right? So I can do Snell's law like across the entire smooth transition. And if the angle is so large that we do have total internal reflection, it's going to smoothly, it's going to turn around and come back. Now, so this kind of solves our quandary, right? Reflection is something that um, Fermat's principle can't predict. Say we take the limit, we, we, we squish this region down as narrow and, and narrow as possible, then we get an interface now and we always get total internal reflection I'm having a hard time saying this. We always get refraction, all the energy refracts until we have enough of, a, of an index difference and an, a, a broad enough launch angle to get total internal reflection that always reflects. Um, you might be wondering what happens if we have some weird distribution of n like this, where if I graph n with respect to z, there's a well in it, so in goes down and then comes back up. And then say we launch at just the right angle such that this in is the right in for total internal reflection. Um, well, my intuition about this problem would say that if my launch angle is wide enough such that this angle is the critical angle for this, an this in, is a small enough in to make total internal reflection. It'll just turn around. If it's large enough, if it's small enough, the launch angle is small enough such that this in isn't small enough, it'll go through. And 
if this angle is ex this index is exactly the right index, I've chose just the right combination of index and angle, such that this right here is the low enough index to cause total internal reflection. I'll get this asymptotic behavior where the light will actually never get to z equals zero. Um, it'll just kind of slowly converge to moving along along this um, this minimum here. And we know moving along the minimum is a solution, right? Because right here there's no there's no change in index locally along z. It's a minimum. And so you can have this path where z doesn't change and the light just goes along that minimum. And it's also, we know it's going to be an unstable solution. Um, high indices guide light, right? So if you have a low index region, that's going to be, that's not going to, there's not going to be any guidance there. So if I drift off my solution, I'm going to keep drifting into these regions out here. Um, and um, algebra mathematically showing this rigorously and analytically is difficult because it tends to produce elliptical integrals. Uh, but I can do a numerical simulation and when I do my and you can see that this indeed happens. So in my numerical simulation I made my index of refraction a parabola, right? So my minimum is a parabola, the parabolic minimum, and all minimums will look like a parabola locally around where the minimum is, as long as it's smooth. And I can find a launch angle if I launch it at uh, y equals minus 1, such that my solution just kind of asymptotically approaches the line z equals 0 and never quite gets there. And then if I don't, if I launch at wider angles, so wider angles from vertical, then my light just turns around and goes back and if I launch at shallower angles my light just goes through. Okay so that section was kind of a mess. Um, I tripped over my words a lot um, but I'll probably leave it as is. The reason for that last part was at the beginning of this lecture I tried to justify the existence of paths that weren't local minima using reflection as an example. And I had to make sure that there was a case in which Fermat's principle would predict reflection so that reflection is indeed an example. That being said, I've now demonstrated that when I did that I sort of cheated a little bit. The reason being Say I don't have a sharp interface, but I have a smooth transition. Then what would reduce to total internal reflection, like at a sharp corner at the interface, in the event of an interface, isn't really something that isn't a local minimum anymore. It looks like a local minimum in the case of a smooth transition and a smooth curve. right? It's only when I compress that smooth transition down to a sharp interface that it no longer looks like a local minimum. Um, so, you know, I was kind of wishy-washy there and you can take that how you like. Um, the important thing to take away here is that ray optics as an estimation of electromagnetic optics and wave optics in the case where the index of refraction or the permittivity changes at much larger space scales than the wavelength of the light, right? So if you were to do ray, uh, electromagnetic optics or wave optics and you were to make an estimation, you're trying to reduce it to the case in which your the the spa the scales over which your index changes are very large you will re as you make that scale larger and larger you start to reproduce the behavior of ray optics the wkb approximation might come to mind right as you increase the you you'll notice that if i make my transitions between indices really long and drawn out and gradual as I make them more and more so that way, I reduce the amount of reflection caused by the change in index. 
so I can transition from, say, one waveguide to another by making the waveguides slowly taper into each other. That's a good example of an application of this. But if I decide to take a smooth transition and reduce it to a sharp interface, I'm making the thing that is the most I can think of a violation of the assumptions of the approximation I'm making when I'm doing ray optics. Right? I'm making something that makes ray optics very invalid. And so we would expect if we're trying to use ray optics to describe the behavior of a sharp interface, we would get results that are weird and physically inaccurate. Right? So that gives me somewhat of a pass right? if I'm using ray optics to describe an interface to be somewhat wishy-washy because ray optics in themselves don't really describe an interface. And if we want to describe an interface, we import in knowledge from electromagnetic optics usually. Um, knowledge that there will be reflections and there also will be refractions in general. Okay. Um, so that should wrap this up. I haven't decided yet at the time of me recording this whether or not I'm going to post it on YouTube. Probably if you're watching this, it's because it's on YouTube and you're watching it on YouTube. Um, if that's the case, if you find this and you're watching it on YouTube, YouTube has feedback mechanisms, which is somewhat of a blessing and a curse. Um, I'm just going to remind you that you can use them because sometimes people don't use them unless you remind them that they're there. Um, so I'll be paying attention to that kind of thing. This is the first time um, I've talked into, made, given a lecture by means of talking to nobody, right? Just talking to into a microphone in front of my noisy computer um, and so you, there's you know because because of that I don't have any feedback coming back um, no one can answer me questions and ask me questions in the middle of it so I have no idea what's easy to understand and what's not um, it's also hard to correct myself like on the spot in the same way I could if this were live and I could, you know, try to bring up some sort of credibility for myself. Um, so it's, it's quite tricky if you haven't tried this before. It's, some, it's a little bit tricky to do this. So it was an interesting experiment. Um, I will try to do some more of this. And we'll see what happens.